Welcome everybody to October's Topic Talk, Alumni Success Stories. My name is Dr. Danielle Devers and I am the host of Topic Talk. Today we have some very special guests with us today. Uh, this series is going to focus on alumni success stories, where they are now, uh, how their time here in Strong Hall helps them in their careers, and then also advice on networking and the use of alumni associations in order to help our current students. So where can you connect to alumni? Well, one wonderful place to begin is the University of Montebello's National Alumni Association. This is a resource for you once you graduate, but also before you graduate to hopefully make network connections with alumni from Montebello, from a, really around the world. The director of the Alumni Affairs is actually Strong Hall's own alumna, Tiffany Bunt. And so you can contact her anytime with questions that you have about alumni affairs or trying to get in contact with a, an alumni in order to learn more about it. So on top of that resource, we also have our own mass communication alumni Facebook. Typically, we add students to the mass communication alumni Facebook group the semester before you graduate so that you have the ability to get to know some of our mass communication alumni and network with them for jobs. So along with those two wonderful resources, we also have four people here who can help give us more information about how you can network and utilize alumni association uh, contacts. And so let me start with uh, our guest here in studio. We have Neil Embry. Neil is in the, from the class of 2013. He majored in math communication with a minor in PR. He currently serves as the community editor for the Vestavia Voice and Homewood Star, which are part of parent company Starnes Media. Starnes operates seven newspapers in the Birmingham area, and they are always looking for great interns, so be sure to speak to your advisor about opportunities with Starnes Media. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you for having me. Over Skype today, we have three guests. Uh, first, I'll introduce you to Crystal Swan. Crystal graduated in 2005 with a mass communication and broadcast production double major with a minor in history. Crystal is the assistant news director at Fox 6 WBRC, where she's been working for eight years. She also holds her MBA from the University of Alabama. Roll Tide. Thanks for joining us, Crystal. Uh, also over Skype, we have, and please forgive me for this pronunciation, Eric, but Eric Sanon, nope, I'll try it again. One second. I got my pronunciation guide. San Inocencio. Close enough, Eric. Oh, excellent. Thumbs up. Eric is class of 2003, a mass communication major, and was a leader of the UM baseball team in his junior and senior years. Go Falcon. Uh, Eric joined the Atlantic Coast Conference in 2019 and currently serves as the Associate Commissioner of Strategic Digital Media. He oversees digital and social platforms for the entire ACC League. He's also worked for the Houston Texans. Thank you so much to Eric for joining us today. And last but certainly not least, we have Kaylee Martin. Kaylee graduated most recently in the class of 2016 with a broadcast production major and minors in PR and business. She's a broadcast producer and editor in the Department of Broadcast Production with the Division of Strategic Communication at the University of Alabama. Kaylee is also completing her doctoral degree at the University of Alabama with a focus on journalism and creative media. Thanks so much for joining us, Kaylee. Excellent. Well, thank you so much to everyone who is here today. We're going to start off with a few questions. Uh, so, Kaylee, let's start out with you as our most recent grad. What was your experience like finding a job after the University of Montevallo? Sure. So, I didn't really know what subfield I wanted to go into because, you know, my, I guess, focus when I was here was in broadcast production. And I knew personally I didn't want to go into news. Um, so, and I was also running a business at the time, so I ended up taking a job out of industry that ended up, I got to create content for, which led into a social media content creation job, crafting different pieces of content for those certain platforms for UM, which then transitioned me now to where I'm fully on a broadcast video team um, here at the University of Alabama. So understanding those platforms and stuff really helped me kind of transition um, and it sounds really weird to say, like, well, I took a job out of industry that helped me get into industry, um, but it was actually really good for me because I loved so many different aspects of what we call mass communications that I got to use the whole, like, wide array of skill sets you learn in the program um, 
and even the whole department, which I found hugely beneficial as the landscape kind of keeps changing throughout the years. Wonderful. Thank you for that insight. What about you, Neil? What were some things that you took from your time here at UM that helped you get your career um, as a writer? Yeah. Um, so I had trouble finding a job, you know, right, right out of college. It was a, a two-year process for me. Uh, being a print journalism concentration, it, you know, those jobs can be difficult to find. You know, the industry is changing. Um, those jobs are not as plentiful maybe as they used to be, though I think that we're seeing some of that come back. Um, just as those transitions to more of a digital-based journalism are, are occurring. Um, so I, I worked, um, like Haley, I worked out of industry. Um, it was certainly not anything that necessarily helped me. I was working in retail. Um, but, you know, I, I learned from my time here at Montevallo to just keep working, to keep writing. I did freelance work. Um, I kept up, you know, kept looking for jobs, kept in touch with professors and with Montevallo people just to know if there was anything available. And, um, eventually, I found that first job um, in Arkansas uh, a couple years ago, uh, or a few years ago, and then I moved back three years ago to take a job with Starnes. So. That's wonderful. Well, uh, one thing that uh, Crystal noted when I was speaking with her is that you actually worked while you were at Montevallo. You started your career kind of as a student here. Tell us a little bit more about that, Crystal. I did that. I was um, fortunate enough to find a fellowship program while I was in high school. So I kind of picked the career and then picked the college. Um, and part of picking the college was because I was around so many Montevallo grads at um, NBC 13 at that time. And so they were like, oh, you should definitely um, check out Montevallo. Like I was in high school, I hadn't even picked college yet. I was just in a newsroom. And so they um, really talked up Montevallo. I visited the campus and luckily it was the only school that I ended up applying to that I didn't look anywhere else that once I saw the campus, once I visited it, uh, once I saw the graduates, it was an automatic go for me. So I got a, um, accepted and kept my career at NBC 13 or kept my um, fellowship at NBC 13 while um, being in college at Montevallo. Well, great. Thanks for sharing that experience with us. What about you, Eric? Uh, what was your experience like finding a job after graduating from UM? It's probably a little bit of what everybody mentioned. Uh, I went into a unique path and wanted to continue in sports after my playing days were over. So I too had to find a job outside of sports before I could get uh, get started in. I worked at Home Depot unloading trucks for a year until I was able to get an opportunity, uh, just able to network. And then I got my first internship at the Southeastern Conference. But then as was also mentioned, you know, careers change, uh, the way everything works pivots. When I graduated way back in 2003, YouTube hadn't been invented yet. You know, the iPhone was four years away from its first introduction to the world. And now it's, I strictly work in a digital media capacity and social media capacity. So I think just always being aware of where things are moving, not being afraid to try new avenues. And then also, like you said, building connections, building good relationships that will allow you to get your foot in the door to compete. Because at that point, that's all you can ask for is a chance. And then you see what happens from there. Great. Well, so things that I'm hearing that are common from our alumni Sounds like tenacity, making sure that if you don't get that job straight out of college, you keep looking, you keep pushing, you keep finding, networking, um, innovation, like Neil was, uh, uh, excuse me, that Eric was speaking about just a moment ago. So what are other things that you learned from your time here at UM that you believe helped you as you were looking for a career and then to land that job? Crystal, why don't we start with you? What were some of the main takeaways you got from Strong Hall? Um, so I felt like my career gave me a skill, my, my time in Montevallo gave me a skill set more than anything that I um, look at this kind of, this work is kind of blue collar in a way that we have to use our hands. We have to use, you know, a skill to do the job. And I think um, taking classes uh, in engineering and uh, editing and Photoshop and all of those things help me prepare for what it is that I needed to do as far as skills go in um, a newsroom or in whatever career path that I chose. So I really think that you gave me a skill set. Wonderful. What about you, Eric? What were some of the top takeaways that you had from your time here in Strong Hall that you believe helped prepare you for your career? I think for me, it was an ability to try lots of different things. You know, I think one of the benefits of being in a bit of a smaller program in a smaller university 
is that you get some more one-to-one -one attention and you're not pigeonholed into something specific right when you arrive. And for me, I thought, you know, much like others, I was going to be a print journalist, but then I decided, oh, wait a minute, I like this side of it better. And you get a flexibility to go into a major and really experience everything that comes along with it, whether it's in front of the camera, behind the camera, writing, all those different facets. So I think once you get onto the real world, having as many tools in your tool belt as possible is always beneficial. And I think Montevallo allowed me to do that, learn as much as I could while I was there. That's wonderful. Now, Neil, I know you were a print concentration, so you kind of had a vision for what you wanted to do in the right. future. How did Bonavallo help you develop that skill set while still maintaining your competitiveness out in such a competitive journalism field? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, Montevallo really taught me those, those basic skill sets like that Crystal mentioned. You know, I learned how to write, I learned how to edit my own work, how to edit others, other people's work. Um, I learned how to interview, to report, to do all of those basic things that if you're in journalism, no matter, even no matter what concentration you're in, no matter what, you know, may change, you know, you've still got to be able to ask good questions. You've still got to be able to write a good story. Uh, you've still got to be able to do those basic things. And so Montevallo really, for me, laid that foundation, laid that groundwork, and, and it helped me get freelancing opportunities. It helped me get an internship while I was here at, at Montevallo with the Alabama Baptist. Um, and so those, those things may not have paid dividends in the short run, but over time it, it, did, it did help and it helps me now as I've moved from a reporter's role, um, even though I'm still reporting to an editor's role where I'm leading, um, I'm helping lead a staff and all those things, it's, um, it, it can all be traced back to the, that groundwork that was laid here. So. Oh, I love that. Now, Kaylee, you have kind of gone through a, a large change in career, going from, um, you know, working on strategic communications, now going into academia. What were some of the skill sets that help you tackle all of these various types of careers and research that you do, both as a PhD student, but then also working within industry? I'm muted. <laughs> <laughs> we were just about to ask you, but that's all right. Hey, the broadcasters are always the ones that forget to unmute. It's, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I went to college for this. Um, so like I said, that y'all couldn't hear, I felt like it taught me flexibility, which is kind of what people have said. Um, and I think that's not only attributed to the wonderful program that we have here, but also to the liberal arts education system as a whole. Like it teaches you to never stop learning. And I think that's really essential, you know, when you're in industry. But also for me, as I'm transitioning to academia, I still have to keep learning. I have to know these are the skill sets that current producers and editors and things are using. Here's how it translates in a research context. And then also here's how it translates to the classroom. So for me, you know, I may be writing a bunch of boring research papers now, but I'm still going to Adobe Max and I'm learning about Premier Rush and, you know, all these things to make sure that I'm staying up to date as well. And I think um, for me, just flexibility and a love of learning are two things that the program taught me that are not, a, I guess, a technical skill set that I'll always take with me. Um, because they just give, gave me endless opportunity to always learn. I remember taking a drone class. Um, I remember taking different, you know, After Effects classes. So there's just endless opportunity for you to learn what you want. And that can seem overwhelming because you want to learn everything, but that's the beauty of it is that's what the program's for, is for you to learn. Well, and I think that that's great advice for our students to take advantage of those classes, those opportunities to learn as much as you can now. Well, speaking about advice for career prep, we have students, you know, ranging from freshmen to seniors. We also have transfers who are looking at graduation soon. What kinds of advice would you give as an alumni to students who are looking to prepare their careers, whether that's starting out as a freshman or all the way to senior year? Eric, what kinds of advice do you have for our students in terms of career prep? I guess it depends on how long you want me to go, but I'll try to be concise. <laughs> the down and dirty. Give me the broadcast think, Bosop uh, version. I think anything you can do to make yourself a person instead of a name on a resume will always be beneficial to you. And I think secondly, if you're looking to have a career and move to places that are outside this local region, you have to come to grips that you probably won't have a ton of name recognition immediately 
in your college. And so you may have to network a little bit further because it won't be something that's immediately recognizable. Doesn't mean it's a bad thing. I'm super proud of where I went and I've worked in the NFL and I've worked in college athletics. Um, but I don't come in with you know a, a pedigree of Harvard or something like that where people immediately know where you went. You might have to take that extra step. So I think just making yourself a person throughout this process and connecting, especially if you're in unique fields, right? Uh, people hire folks that they feel comfortable with, people that they would like to work with. So it's important as you can to build those relationships because that will get you opportunities that you may not even know are available. That's great advice. What do you think, Crystal? What would be some advice that you'd like to give to our students, uh, whether they're starting out as freshmen or about to graduate next uh, in the December? Always reach out um, and network within the alumni community. That um, now that I'm in a role where I have to hire people, what I found most interesting is that a lot of people who have the skill set don't apply for jobs, which is the weirdest thing. It's like people want to be found instead of uh, applying for jobs. So surprisingly enough, apply for the job, reach out to the alumni network, and then try to um, leverage what Eric just said, that, that connection that we have in this region to get jobs. Um, be flexible enough to be able to leave the region, be able to leave the state of Alabama. I think that Bill pointed out that he had to go to Arkansas in order to get that big break. So don't be afraid to leave and you never know who you're going to meet in these areas that's from Montevallo or from the state of Alabama. So be sure to um, be flexible with what your goals look like. They could take you across the country, around the world and back again for the job you want. Yeah, I think that's excellent advice. And Neil, that really is your story of, you know, taking advantage of networks, making sure that um, you were willing to go anywhere to start out small and, and come back to where you really wanted to be. So what kinds of advice would you give to students who are looking to build careers now um, based on your experience? Yeah. I would say you, you've got to just, you've got to stick with it. Um, if you've made the decision that this is what you want to do, that you want to be a journalist, that you want to be, whether that's a print journalist, broadcast journalist, whatever you want to do with this degree path that, you, that you've chosen, if this is what you want, then you've got to be persistent. Um, I spent two years sending out more than 50 job applications. I didn't hear back from most of them um, until one day I randomly got a call from a job that I'd forgotten that I applied for, and, and that led me to where I am now. Um, you've got to be persistent. Um, you know, this is, uh, and, and it really, I, I, I'm grateful for that time, as difficult as it was, because, you know, this is a difficult job. You know, journalism is not easy. My job is not easy, and so that almost prepared me for the work, uh, but it's incredibly rewarding. And so stick with it. Keep writing, keep shooting, keep editing, whatever it is you want to do. I would just encourage you to to stick with it, to get as much experience as you can because so much of what we do is it's experience based and the only way you're going to improve is if you just keep doing it and keep at it and, um, and don't, be, uh, don't be afraid to take constructive criticism either. So. Excellent, great career advice. Kaylee, you were in this position not five years ago really, I mean graduating in 2016. What kinds of advice do you have for students who are in this position now? First, I would say Keep developing the relationships you have with your advisors. Um, I think that's so important. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've called Dr. Finkley and said, could I put you as a reference on XYZ? <laughs> um, and, you know, and even when I graduated, I had Dr. Cofield. Um, I had a former professor, Mr. Pruitt, um, all vouching for me, saying she knows these skills, um, and that was vitally important. And they also help you, they give you that critique and that criticism that you need to grow. Um, and second, I actually took advantage of this while I worked at Montevallo and thought, why didn't I do this as a student? But go to the UM Career Center. It's a fabulous resource. Um, I remember going to them, I was, about to, I was applying to a master's program and I went and they looked at my resume and they were like, oh, well, you need to put these things on your resume to show your media experience. And I was like, oh, you're so right. <laughs> because I'm an introvert, so I'm terrible at highlighting the things I do well. And so they were like, you need to put these things on your resume. Um, and they also explained how a reel, like an edit reel, is like a cover letter. So you can tailor edit reels to the position that they're looking for. So like if I was coming here, for example, they would want very brand-centered videos, um, maybe a little bit of athletics thrown in there. 
um, you want to show that you can create the content that they're looking for. Um, so that would be my second tip is, you know, first, make sure you're networking with your advisors here. Make sure you're networking with the professors here because they really do care about your success. But then also go to the career center and just have a second pair of eyes look at your resumes and, and teach you those soft skills about interviewing. I remember my first interview, I showed up in jeans and that was a big no-no. <laughs> so they taught me the soft skills of interviewing and things that as a creative, I just didn't know. Um, so learning those soft skills and taking advantage of the UM resources that you have is so important because, you know, there's no, there's no career center out there when you're an adult. Like, you're just kind of Googling, you know, what to wear to an interview and some Medium article pops up. You know, you want to make sure you're taking advantage of those wonderful resources you have. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you mentioned advisors as well. Of course, advising season is coming up, students, so make sure that you schedule your meeting with your advisor between now and when registration opens for spring and summer. And not only should you be talking to your advisors about what classes do I take uh, for spring and summer, but also what are my career goals? What does it look like when I step outside of graduation? Um, what do I need to do in one year after graduation? Where do I want to be five, ten years from now? And your advisors can help you to better understand what that career path looks like and then also suggest other things. Um, for instance, uh, Crystal, I know you went and got your MBA, which is a large you know, part of leadership and knowing how to run a newsroom and a business. Um, what are some of the things that helped you know how to do that and, and what you needed to do in order to get to where you wanted to be. So I guess what I'm really asking is, how do you help set your career goals and what are the resources that got you there? Well, Dr. Cofield was my advisor there, so shout out to Dr. Cofield for um, putting me in all the classes that I needed to graduate first and to um, figure out what it was that I wanted to do, so thank you for that. Um, I think around 2008 when the economy pretty much tanked and uh, we saw mass layoffs in every department. Um, we were becoming leaner and leaner operations around the country in every broadcasting um, newsroom, everything. It didn't matter what the, what the job was. It was hard to find. And I really wanted to know more about economics. I really wanted to understand more about the money part of this business that I think we're all creatives. I think we all come into MassCom thinking, oh, well, I can create something. And one of the things that I realized really quickly is that art doesn't move without money. So if I could figure out the money, if I could learn the money, then I could probably learn how to move my art, to move what it is that I do every single day in writing other people's story or telling people's story. So for me, that translated into an MBA that translated into me going to my news director and saying, hey, I don't want to be a producer my entire life. What am I going to do next? How do, you buy, how do I get to the next level? And interestingly enough, um, NBC 13 at the time had cut out all middle management. So there was nowhere to grow or nowhere to go after producing. It was like, okay, so there's no EPs. There's no middle management. It's like you've got to go to the news director in one field suite, and nobody can do that. So I got an MBA, started for a job. I thought that I was going to have to stay because of um, contracts and non-disclosure, not non-disclosure, what's it called? Non-competes. Because of non-competes, I just knew that I was going to have to leave the state. That this was it. This was my next move. And lo and behold, I ended up getting a job at Fox 6 because the position I had didn't have a non-compete. I didn't know it didn't, but I was glad that it didn't. <laughs> but I also had to take lap that I had to go from a producer, an overnight producer to an assignment editor, which to most the complete lateral move, there was no good, you know, that's not a normal trick or what I wanted to do, but I knew if I got the skills, if I learned, if I um, positioned myself as a leader, no matter where I went, that I would finally get an opportunity to do it, and that's what happened. That I stayed on the assignment by I became a nice I producer. I only became, stayed 
me for two years was not being promoted to assistant news director. But that's because I had to find um what Kaylee said, those soft skills leadership skills um translate in every facet of any business that you go into. And if you can prove that you're a leader, then you can go to the next level. I love that. And so much of what Montevallo is and what our classes are about are integrating the hard skills of our profession along with the professionalism skills that are absolutely needed for your career. Um, I know, Eric, you were talking about that earlier um, and how just utilizing networks, for instance, was so important for you, particularly since Montevallo isn't necessarily a name that is known nationwide. And yet, I will say, as a non-Montevallo alum, our alumni are incredible, and they are invested, and they want to return the favor that Montevallo gave to them. So how did you use those uh, alumni networks, Eric, in, in your career path? So I think it's important to note that in addition to the wonderful work that your advisors can do for you on campus, you can build networks at Montevallo when you're already there with people that you interact with every day. That was a, a good example for me. I mean, two of the biggest mentors I've had in my life was my baseball coach, but then the other was the sports information director when I was there. His name is Dwayne Peavy. Now he's the athletic director at DePaul. And so when I was playing baseball and he was the SID, we talked a lot about what a career path and sports information could be like it. It intrigued me. It wasn't something that I even knew existed. So, you know, we've been friends for a really long time and we've worked to help support each other. And when you're in sports, you're in a little bit of a smaller space when it comes to networks. So I would encourage everybody, everyone you meet could potentially be somebody that could work with you or partner with you in the future. So don't necessarily always look outside of Montevallo for opportunities to grow your network. It could be the people that are sitting right next to you that are the next future leaders that you can tap into. And before you know it, something special happens down the road. Excellent. And I would also say, you know, when we have these topic talks, when we have Explore Mass Comm Day or, you know, various events where alumni are coming in and volunteering their time, take advantage of those opportunities. When you have guest speakers in your classrooms, those are excellent places to network as well. And we're so grateful to the four of you for offering up that time and offering yourself as a resource to students. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take some questions um, from the students who are here in studio. Uh, what questions do you guys have for our, our alums? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Um, so y'all talked about like being great at being able to adapt as the industry moves forward and stuff like that. How do you know whether to adapt or to stay in your path and try and keep working in your field? Like, how do you know when to switch? So uh, Steve's question is, how do you know when to adapt and innovate? How do you know when to stick with what the current professional norms are, the foundations of the field? So how do you know when to be flexible and when to conform? So Neil, I'll let you start, yeah. particularly coming from a print industry right. where everybody yeah. is like, your industry is not viable. Right. And yet you've shown time and time again that it is. So right. how do you do that? How do you manage that? Yeah. I think that a lot of that is <clears throat> you have to learn what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. Uh, you have to know what your standards are, what your goals are, and you have to define those for yourself. Um, you, know, you also have to be willing to learn new tasks. Uh, you know, the print industry now, you know, a lot of the tasks that I do is exactly what I thought I would be doing. It's just adding a little bit of technology to it. It's adding that online piece to it that um, really even when I was here at Montevallo, you know, was just kind of new. Um, and so you really just have to learn what, what, are, what are my goals, what are my standards, what am I willing to do, and what am I not willing to do. Uh, I, I don't know that there's a hard and fast rule of, you know, when to adapt and when not to adapt as much as it is, you know, who do I want to be, what kind of uh, person, what kind of professional do I want to be. And I think that negotiation of what are my personal values, what are the values of the industry, and, and what do my peers think, as well as, but how can I maintain that rel relevance through technology and innovation? I think that that's a hard transition to find, but it's an important one. Kaylee, you work specifically with some very innovative technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality, even um, some of the graphics that you build for commercials and things like that. You're using some really innovative things. 
what's that negotiation like between foundations of the industry, but then learning new things? Yeah, um, so I think it's kind of along like what Neil said. You're, even as an editor, you have to know your standards. Um, so like for me as a brand journalist, I've on some level chosen to give up my autonomy and the fact that I am a voice for a brand. So I, I do have to say things in the brand voice. And, but as a journalist, trained in a journalist background, I'm not gonna say anything that's untrue. Um, so that's just kind of like on a basic level. On a tech level, sometimes the technology does dictate the changes. So like a joke that we make in our office right now is that Premiere is getting rid of legacy titles. So if you've grown up learning editing up to this point, all you've learned is legacy titles. And now you've got this new essential graphics panel that Premiere has rolled out. So sometimes the technology will dictate the change on the more technolog technological side. Um, but there's still that question of what kind of editor do I want to be? What kind of colorist do I want to be? Um, you know, for me, I, I always hark back to what are the basic things that I learned in, you know, MassCom 215? Um, what are these basic skills? Because I can tell you, on one hand, I could probably count, oh, I need to do very specific fancy thing in After Effects. But I can tell you, nine times out of 10 every day, I have to go, okay, what's that very basic skill set that we learned in MassCom 215, you know, that I need to call back right now? Um, so I think you're gonna need to innovate with the technology, but really in order to innovate, you need to remember those base skill sets that you learn um, that seem like, Ugh, why do I need to learn transcribing interviews? I'm never gonna have to do this, but you will, you will have to do it. And you'll be glad that you learned it um, because it helps you, all of these things make you a stronger editor and help you kind of see those innovations coming and also learn, uh, I don't feel like I need to jump on this one just yet. Yeah. You know, Crystal and I, uh, before the newscast, both being um, broadcasters, we're talking about sweeps and how, you know, during a sweeps period, most broadcast journalists cannot take off work. It's when a lot of your ratings and advertising funds come in. And she was like, oh yeah, we don't do sweeps anymore at Fox 6. And I was floored, honestly. And I've, I've been working in the industry for over a decade. Um, so Crystal, tell me a little bit about how business sometimes dictates innovations in workplace and leadership styles. I was going to answer that student's question with always adapt and always innovate. Like, the, I don't know that there is a place in this industry where you do not have to innovate. That I probably spend 70% uh, of my job every day trying to figure out how are we going to make weather more presentable? How are we going to um, get more out of less? That we literally spend the entire day innovating at the next level. That um, whether you're the number four station in the market, you're trying to innovate to get to number one. And if you're number one, you're trying to innovate to stay number one. So there is no place where you have to just, okay, I'm number one, these are the basics, and I'm here. You always have to find the next level. So one of the things that we found out um, is that we could get data um, overnight. It's a Nielsen data. We just had to pay a little more money, but we could get the the ratings overnight every single day and that's how they could that's how the sales department can make their rate and charge what they charge um on our tv side the other thing that we also learned is that we can monetize digital now that i think one of the things that i learned coming into this is that everybody wanted to figure out how are we going to make money off the internet we figured it out so everybody knows how to make money off the internet now and so there's this push to digital there's this push to better journalism as far as um, websites go. There's a place for all of those people who wrote for newspapers to now write for broadcast companies. And so that's the next level of innovation is that how do I transition that skill from newspaper to a broadcast company? That one of the things that you'll continuously find in this business is that regulations change, money will always dictate how you um, do the job, and then you have to innovate to make more money. That's why you have to innovate, you have to adapt, that what you come in and did, where you had a reporter and a photographer go out, shoot a story, put it together and present it on the 5 o'clock news, that reporter now works by themselves, they shoot, they edit, 
They do all of that by themselves and they're doing it three times as hard because they're trying to do at least two to three stories a day and present them at 5, 5.30, 6, 6.37 and maybe 24 hours at that point because you have a digital outlet that says I can be on at all times. So always be willing to innovate. And all three of you who've answered so far are really speaking about a convergent media practice. It's not just about being a print reporter or, in Crystal's case, a broadcast journalist or Kaylee being an editor, right? It's about knowing all things for all situations and being willing to utilize the skill that's needed in that moment. Um, and I love that. Eric, you and the ACC do that very well. You're really writing to traditional platforms, but you're also writing to innovative and social and digital platforms. So how would you answer the student's question about innovation versus uh, maintaining you know, your current identity and your current practices? I think a lot of great points have been shared already. And I think the key is, is you don't have to be a master at all the different platforms and opportunities out there, but you need to be aware of them. So when a particular campaign comes up, you know what options you have to pursue to maximize the return on your investment. So as, especially in social, a new platform pops up every other day, right? And it doesn't mean that the ACC needs to be on it or that we need to reconfigure our business model or strategy to include it. But I know that if there's something in particular where I'm trying to get over to an audio-based audience, then I may use Twitter Spaces, and that might be the only time I use it. So again, it's just being aware of all the different options out there, having a basic understanding of how they work, and then if you need to come back to it, knowing that the tool's available and then digging a little bit deeper. Excellent. Well, we have time for one more student question from our audience. Uh, does any other student have a question? Yeah, go ahead. So this is very common in the media industry. Our student is asking, based on the experiences of our panelists, you get rejections, you know, whether that's when you apply for a job or when you try to pitch a particular kind of story or maybe, you know, you want the commercial storyboard to look this way, but your client doesn't like it. How do we face rejection in the media field and grow from it and not let it set us back? Um, let's start out with Eric. Go ahead. So I think I got a lot of practice at this in college because in baseball, if you get a hit three out of 10 times, you're considered really good, which means that you failed the other seven. So it's kind of ingrained in me to continue to get back up. I think Denzel Washington has a fantastic quote. If you fall down nine times, you get up 10. So I think there's time for reflection in those moments where things don't go your way and you can learn from them and improve. But I think what I've learned most is that opportunity is always right around the corner. You're not defined by one decision. You know, you're defined by the length of a career. So when those situations happen, when things uh, don't go exactly the way you plan or you're rejected from something, take some time, uh, mentally recoup, recharge, and then go right back out there if this is really what you want to do. Maybe a string of rejections leads you to believe, hey, maybe I need to pivot to something else and this is not something I want to deal with. That's okay as well. But what I've always found is to try to continually learn is the beauty, especially about what I do in social media, you know, you're going to get immediate feedback for campaigns that you do, and it's not always going to be a positive response. So what can we learn? How is our process? What can we improve upon the next time we try? I love that. What about you, Kaylee? Um, I'm sure that uh, you faced rejection, whether that's uh, in your editing career or even in academia. So what advice do you have for students about rolling with those punches? Mm -hmm. I would say don't be afraid of failing. Obviously, it stings to not get this job that you wanted or Maybe you are in the job and you worked on this project and it, you thought this is the greatest thing I've ever edited and it comes back and it was not. <laughs> but I think never be afraid of failing. Um, that was something that I learned in the program was, you know, you do an edit and maybe it, you know, wasn't the best edit, but you get critique from it and you learn from it. And that never stopped me from what I originally loved about MassCom was I love creating content. I love media. Um, so always go back to that, your why. Why did, why did I get into this? Why do I want to do this? And for me, it was that I loved creating content. I loved um, making these, you know, pieces. And so even though I did get a rejection from a job or, you know, something in the job, um, I never stopped creating. It never dampened my love for editing. It never dampened my love for creativity. 
Um, so I think don't be afraid to fail because failing, you can always fail forward. You can always learn from it. Um, you can always grow. Um, and so I would say, you know, when you if you get that job rejection, you know, go to the career center. Do you think there's anything about my resume that needs to be tweaked? Or go to your advisors. Do you think I could have, you know, wrote my cover letter a different way? Or maybe you actually got to the interview part, you know, what are some things I could have said differently in the interview? You know, always try to, you know, like I said, fail forward. Always grow and learn from these different um, missed opportunities, because even missed opportunities are opportunities to grow. I love, Kaylee, how you mentioned that, you know, these classes, your curriculum here at Montevallo is really an opportunity to do just that, to fail forward, to use your faculty members as a sounding board for ways to grow and continue to become a better content creator. What about you, Crystal? Obviously, broadcast is full of no's, so how do you deal with rejection? Um, I think it was John Wooten that said, failure isn't fatal, but failure to change is. And so you, it's not the end of the world, that there are stories that get rejected every single day, that um, I constantly pitch stories and then I'm like, NBC 13 is doing it, you know, like, why didn't y'all pick when I pitched it? But that's, um, that's the a daily thing where even in my position where I say yes or no, I still get no. And um, you just have to keep moving forward. Kaylee put it best and Eric said it as well, is that, you know, you get the feedback, you take it in, you figure out what you can, as, as my mom would say, eat the meat, throw away the bone. So you figure out what's the good parts what your criticism is and then you throw away the rest of it, that's just critiquing your character. So you gotta know when something is critiquing your skill and when something's critiquing your character and then making sure that you just go. I love that advice. You know, Neil, I think a lot of our students struggle in the feeling of failure, the feeling of rejection. How do you as a journalist kind of develop that tougher skin to know that it's gonna happen and we don't take it personally, but we fail forward. How, how do you think we develop that? So I think that, you know, for me personally, like I said earlier, I, I applied um, literally to more than 50 jobs um, across the country. I applied for a job in North Dakota. I'm not even sure I know how to get to North Dakota. <laughs> um, you know, and, you know, you develop that tough skin by remembering that, that really, especially if you were a new graduate, they're rejecting more than likely what they're rejecting is your lack of experience. They're not saying that you can't do the job. They might just be looking for somebody with more experience. They might just be looking for somebody who had that internship, which, you know, it's another, you know, again, piece of advice to take an internship, to get as much experience as you can. Um, but also to remember that, you know, someone will take a chance on you to be persistent. You know, for me, it was a newspaper in Northeast Arkansas that, they loved hiring young people. They loved hiring new journalists, and the editor there um, did a great job of, of training me and taking me under his wing, and I'm grateful that he took that chance on me, and that's, that's what you're looking for, is for someone to take a chance on you as a new graduate. You know, what you don't have is experience. What you can do is make up for that and just that, that persistent, you know, I'm going to keep applying, I'm going to keep writing, I'm going to keep editing whatever it is I'm doing, I'm going to keep putting myself out there, you know, and, and remember that it's not an attack on you. It's not, you know, letting, telling you that you were a bad person because you didn't get that job or this job and to just keep at it. Um, and especially in this business, tough skin, I mean, it's, it's incredibly important to have, especially if you're, if, you'll be out, if you're going to be out there in the field and you're going to be writing some tough stories, you're going to be asking some tough questions, um, you know, there will be people that are upset with you. You're going to have stories that don't go over well with some people, and you've got to learn to just be okay with that. And so I think in some ways that helped me going through all of those job rejections, helped me develop that thick skin that I needed. Um, and again, like I said earlier, if, if this is something that you want to do and this is the career that you want, to not give up and to keep going at it, to keep trying until, until you get that phone call, until you get that job. So. I love that. Uh goal of being persistent and just going for what you want, knowing what you want and continuing to go for it. It's a theme I'm hearing from all of our alumni and so we're gonna claim that as something that we as Montevallo instill in, in our alumni, hopefully. Um, so hopefully students are, are doing that, are really learning from being persistent. 
what is that piece of advice that you wish you had had as a student that now from your perspective as an alumni, you want our students to know? Let's start out with you, Kaylee. I knew you were going to call me first. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think for me, again, it would have been the thing that I like didn't learn that I wish I would have learned was that the so I guess the soft skills for interviewing as a creative. Um, because I knew if you entered news, obviously you had to look very professional and you had to dress a certain way um, because you're going to be on TV, you're doing news. But for the production side, I mean, again, I didn't understand the concept of your reel is like a cover letter. Um, and so you want to tailor that to where you want to work. And um, I also, one thing that I, if I could go back and tell undergrad Kaylee, I would say utilize the alumni networks. Um, I think I did that one time and I actually went to Los Angeles to talk to a UM alum who was there, who was an editor um, in the field I thought I wanted to do. Um, but I wish I would have done that more because it was so great talking to her, hearing her experience, especially as a female editor, um, just because it's, you know, there's not many female editors once you get in industry. And so to have that representation and to see that at a younger age would have been hugely beneficial for me um, in kind of knowing, okay, I can do this. I can get out here. I can be an editor and be a female. Um, and so I wish that I would have taken more advantage of the alumni network. So for students, like, you're not weird if you reach out to an alum and say, hey, could I ask you some questions? Or I'm going to, I would like to work here. Um, could I talk to you about it? Um, no alum is going to be like, I don't want to talk to you. Like, we've all been where you've been. Um, and so we would love to give that back to a place that's so special to us and did so much for us. We would love to pass that down to the next generation and say, here's some things I did. Here's some advice. Um, Maybe buy them a coffee. If you're too poor of a college student and you can't buy coffee, even even just the, hey, please meet with me over Zoom, like we would be more than happy to do that. Um, so I would say if I could go back to, you know, 2014, 2015, Kaylee, I would say go talk to some alumni. Don't be so shy. Like reach out. Um, so yeah, just take advantage of those alumni networks because we really have been where you are. We really do understand the questions you're asking. Um, and we would be more than happy to talk. Yeah, and I've never met a Montevallo alumni who wasn't willing to bend over backwards for a student and um, really give of their time and of themselves their knowledge. Um, and yet I think so few students do it because they feel that, that hesitancy to reach out. So um, Neil, what would you say um, to yourself, walk in these halls in Strong Hall, what, what do you wish you would have known that you can share with our students? Uh, I think I would just echo really what Kaylee said of, you know, not being afraid to reach out. You know, for me, what I've found is you need to find those people that are in the positions that you want to have. You need to find those professionals that you you, you want to emulate, that you want to be like, you know, and I, and I have that at my current job now. Um, I've got colleagues of mine that have been doing this, you know, since before I was born, and I'm constantly asking them, how do you handle this? How would you pursue this story? What questions would you ask? How would you write this? What should I do here? You know, take advantage of those relationships that you have with your faculty here. You know, you, you're blessed with some great professors who have, you know, not only experience in the classroom, but experience in the field. Um, take advantage of that. Ask those questions. Find those people that you feel like you can learn from and, and try to learn from them because that, that really will give you an advantage over someone who doesn't when you're applying for jobs, when you're, even when you're in that first job you're going to be better prepared to do it and to stand out um, if you take advantage of those relationships. And there are tons of resources to help our students do that, whether it's topic talks, uh, professionalism throughout the curriculum, your faculty members, your advisors. We also have our alumni association that uh, Tiffany Bunt runs here on campus uh, in Reynolds Hall. You can always go visit her to make those connections our mass communication alumni page, um, and then just generally people that you meet and want to connect to. So don't be afraid to reach out. Crystal, what final advice do you have for our students? Have fun. That, you know, you're never going to get another chance to be a college student. Um, and if you do, then it's probably going to be as an adult with responsibilities. 
And so one of the things that I would tell myself is that, you know, you don't have to work as hard, that enjoy the moment, that you can enjoy getting to know your classmates, that, you know, networks are built through relationships. And so the people that you're meeting in your classes are could be your coworkers one day. They could be the subjects that you're interviewing one day. So go over to the um, theater department and get to know some of those people because you don't know who's the future actor or who's going to Broadway that you're going to have to feature on. Get to know the people in the music department. Get to know some of the teachers who are getting educated there because they could be shaping the, the next generation that you hire. So I would say have a lot of fun. Build natural relationships with each other. And that way, when you go to the next level, we can continue to make Montevallo a household name in this industry with that relationship building that, you know, we may not have had the opportunity to say, oh, I went to Montevallo and everybody knows what it is. But as more people come out and become successful and we have genuine relationship, we can make Montevallo a household name. And it should be because everyone belongs at Montevallo, right? Um, all right, uh, Eric, why don't you wrap us up with your final piece of advice for our undergraduate students? I would just say it's okay that if you don't know everything right now, you don't need to exactly understand what path you're going to take. My job, current job, didn't even exist when I was in college. So try to learn everything and don't feel so much pressure that you have to take a linear path to whatever you want your career to be. Be open and explore it all. You might find something that you like along the way. Excellent. Well, thank you so much to all of our panelists who joined us in person through Skype. We very much appreciate you sharing your perspective um, on the side of things um, because we know that many of our students are going to be wonderfully successful alumni in just a few years. So uh, thank you again to our panelists. Make sure, students, that you're thinking through these things. Even if you're a freshman, start now. Have those conversations with your advisors. Try to find those connections. Uh, work through different options, work through different plans, because you never know what's going to be right for you. Um, be sure to meet with your advisor from now until uh, class is open to have those kinds of discussions. And don't forget, think about those internships, just like Neil was saying, just like Crystal worked uh, during her school year. Uh, that can be an excellent resource for you as well. So be sure to join us for our November topic talk. Uh, it will be our last topic talk of 2021. And it will be on how you can use social media to build your personal brand to catch the eye of employers. So we hope to see you then. Thanks again to our panelists for our time. Thank you to our student audience and our uh, production crew. Big thank you to Dr. Cofield, Mr. Vest, Dr. Finkley for always being there. Um, and again, those are the relationships that stick. You hear our alumni talk about our faculty because they made such a big difference. So be sure to thank a faculty member today too. All right, have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. We'll see you for our November topic talk.